I'm going to be talking today about using Python with a distributed key value store. My name is Stephen Pimentel. I'm with a company called Foundation DB. We're a, st a small startup in the Washington, D.C. area, Tyson's Corner, Virginia. I'm on Twitter at Stephen Piment. I've been tweeting a lot of talks throughout this conference. And the IPython notebook and backing code is on my GitHub here. And I'll repeat all this information at the end. So you'll have another chance to grab it. So this is all about storage. All of us have had the experience of having data that we need to store, whether it's a web application or, or what, whatever your situation is. It's, it's, it's almost ubiquitous that you have to be able to often uh, store data in some sort of back end. So what are the alternatives for this? Well, there are some Python-specific tools, ZODB, PyTables. Of course, there's the venerable SQL options, Postgres, SQLite. There's various ORMs that folks use to try to wrap SQL, make it a bit nicer. And then there's a lot of these newer NoSQL no um, options, document data stores, graph databases like Neo4j, uh, key value stores. Well, FoundationDB is a key value store that works on distributed clusters. And that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about. So what's a key value store? Well, basically, it's a very, very simple concept. Keys map to values, very much like in a Python dictionary. It's, it's essentially the simplest data model that you could think of for a database. And in fact, it underlies almost every other data model being used. For example, uh, most um, SQL databases, when you get down to how they're actually storing the data on disk, it's something like a key value store. And in SQLite 4, for example, that's made explicit. They actually expose the key value store API so you can see that. In a lot of other databases, you can't explicitly see that, but it's still true. There's still a layer at which that's done. And that's true pretty much of graph databases and document databases as well. So what's FoundationDB? What's distinctive about it? What does it bring to this story? Well, it's a key value store that runs on distributed clusters of commodity hardware. And what it exposes is a single ordered key space for very efficient range reads. And we're going to see that that ordering property is uh, very important. It gives a lot of power beyond just a sort of vanilla key value store. And the other thing it adds to the mix is full ACID transactions. And when I say full ACID transactions, I mean a couple things. One, th there's strong isolation, so it's ACID in the strongest sense. But also, it allows you to do multi-key transactions, regardless of where the data is stored on the network, what node it's on. So cross-node, cross-key transactions. And that gives you a lot of power. Makes it easy to build richer data models on top of the key value store. I'll just give you two examples. We have a layer architecture where we build layers on top of the key value store. And two that we've built are a SQL layer that supports full ANSI SQL that maps down to the key value store. And another is a document uh, layer that gives you JSON objects very, very much like MongoDB. In fact, we're very compatible with MongoDB clients. So ACID, some of you are familiar with this. Some of you may not be if you don't have a, a database background. It stands for Atomic, Consistent, Isolated, and durable, and these are the, pro the essential properties of transactions. They're what make transactions really work. So isolation. We support this, uh, seri what's called serializability. Serializability means that a transaction executes as if it were sequential, even though you may actually be ex executing in a highly concurrent environment. In terms of the side effects, in terms of how your database gets mutated, it's going to be executed as if there were some fully serialized or sequential order of those transactions. And this is really a crucial property because it allows you to reason locally when you're writing your code. When you're actually writing Python code, you can write as though you're in a fully sequential environment even though you're going to have concurrent reads and writes happening globally from multiple clients. So the whole point of this is to support multiple clients writing the database concurrently and still get the right answers. 
It allows you to maintain invariant, so that if you write your code to maintain some invariant that would, that would be maintained in a, in a sequential environment, it'll still obtain under concurrency. And so that the impact of any given client is isolated. So here's an example, very simple. You can think of if you're writing an application for say a government agency that's using social security numbers to identify individuals. You have some sort of relationship between names and social security numbers. And you may have functions that if you uh, give it a social security number, you can get back the name. And if you give it a name, you can get back the social security number. And you would hope that some invariant obtains um, like if I give it a name, get the social security number, then get the name from that, that it's the same name I started with. Now, of course, <laughs> this is not a real life example. You can easily think, well, that's really a many to one relationship that wouldn't quite work. Let, just go with it. Um, it's, it's supposed to be a, a very simple to understand example. So that, that's a, uh, an invariant um, that you want maintained. But if you think about it, there's lots of ways for that to get screwed up in a concurrent environment. Say you have one client doing reads in the middle of some, some transaction, and another client working uh, concurrently does rights where, say, someone has gotten married and changed their name. And they're doing an update to their new name that's now associated with the social security number. That right happens concurrently while you're in some other transaction doing a read. It's very easy to see how an invariant like this could get messed up. That's exactly what ACID transactions protect you against. They won't let that happen. OK, so given those properties, ACID enables abstraction. So here's a little snippet. You'll notice up top I have this decorator, FDB transactional. I'm going to explain later what that is and what that does. It basically says this function is to be treated as a transaction. And this is like a snippet from some, you can imagine a leaderboard application where it's, it's maintaining a leaderboard for games or sports as various players' scores are updated. So you're giving it a, 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 a user with the high, high scorer and it, it gets the value of the current um, score, the current rank, and if the score is greater than the high score, it decrements the rank. That, 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 that player just went up in rank. Well, down, actually, since lower is better. And then it stores that back. Well, if you have many clients working concurrently doing rights, again, it's easy to see how that could get messed up if some other high score um, gets established while you're in the middle of this. And again, that transactional nature of the, um, of the function is going to prevent that from happening. So it allows you to define these sorts of abstractions using simple Python functions. It's not pre-built. It's not predefined. It's something you can define. And what this in turn allows is multiple data models. So I talked about our SQL layer, our document layer. You can easily imagine a graph database, um, spatial, geospatial, blobs, columnant oriented. You can implement all these things in layer against a single backend store without having to have separate silos. Okay, so a lot of times people talk about polyglot persistence where you actually have separate back ends to handle different classes of data and that can become a real ops nightmare. So to be able to do this is a really big ops win. Okay, so what does this actually look like in Python when you're working with it? How do we expose this within a Python client? Well, there's this object called DB, which represents the database, and it's a mutable mapping from keys to values, and it's, or, it's also ordered like a sorted dictionary. So as a first approximation, you can think of DB as being like a Python dictionary, only it has an order. You know, Python dictionaries are not ordered. Um, so it's, don't, okay, there's, there's also something in Python called an ordered dict, where the order is established by the order of insertions. That's not what we're talking about here. Here, the order is lexical. It's actually lexical on the keys. And that um, lets you do the range reads very efficiently. And you interact with the database through transactions for your reads and writes. And it's all done using very familiar Python syntax. So transactions basically begin with a snapshot of the database. Then you do reads and writes on the snapshot, and that's then committed at the end. So this would be like a snippet of code from the middle of some transactional function. 
So TR is a transaction object. And here I'm using apple as a key, setting its value to red. The color, I can do, um, so the, the, the first one's a set, then I do a get on the key and, it, on, and get the value back. And I can also do range read. So here in the third line, I'm reading the entire range from the key apple to pear. And it's all using very familiar Pythonic syntax for subscripts and slices. So it's a, it's a very natural programming model. So it, each transaction that you defined is performed as a single unit that corresponds to the property of atomicity. And it's, it's performed independently of any other transaction. That's the property of isolation. And that gives you this building block, this really solid, reliable, easy to use building block for data modeling under concurrency. There's also a lot of sort of magic going on underneath the hood that makes this very, very um, easy to work with, very powerful. All of your reads are asynchronous and non-blocking. So here I have in this snippet two reads on a key A and B. And what happens is when you do a read on A, it returns immediately. Now it's actually going out to the database over the network. So there's some non-trivial latency in actually doing a database read, but it doesn't wait for that latency to complete to return. It returns immediately, so it's non-blocking. And it doesn't actually block until you actually need the value. And the way it works is that when it returns immediately, what it returns is a future, which is basically an object that's going to serve as a container for the value once that value becomes available. So the, 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 the nodes on the server are working in parallel. They're working concurrently with your client. Eventually, that, that value comes back. It's asynchronously written to the container, and then you have it. Now, why is this a big deal? Well, imagine there weren't two reads here. Imagine there were 500. So you have some set of 500 reads you need to do. Each of them will be initiated and return immediately in a non-blocking fashion. You can, do, you can initiate all 500 reads in parallel, and you don't actually block until you actually need to use the value. So it's a, it's a very simple concurrency model. And all of those latencies from the two reads or the 500 reads or whatever it is, they're overlapped rather than being made sequential. So conflicts and retries, how, do this, how does it work? Well, FoundationDB uses an optimistic concurrency model. What that means is that all transactions proceed concurrently until they try to commit. There's no locking involved. There's no, you don't grab a right lock in the beginning or anything like that. They all just sort of proceed optimistically as if they're going to, to succeed. Um, and it's only when they actually go to commit that there's a checking operation. The checking operation looks at all of the, the current um, pending transactions and checks them for conflicts, and only a non-conflicting subset of them will be allowed to succeed. Any that are not conflicting with, with each other can succeed. Those that do conflict go, go back to the um, client with an exception. The client catches an exception, and it knows to retry those transactions because it hasn't succeeded yet. So this is the transactional decorator that I mentioned earlier. And what it does is it, it encapsulates a function in a standard retry loop. So you simply write an ordinary looking Python function. You decorate it with the transactional decorator. That actually gets rewritten into a loop that's going to successively attempt to execute and commit until it succeeds. And there's actually some smart logic in there for exponential back off in case there's some contention going on. Um, it actually works very well. And it, what it does is it makes these kinds of transactions very easy to define and compose. So composition is a really important property. Um, here I have, I've written a little API that codes on the GitHub, but set value is one of these transactional functions that's writing values to some object in the database, it's using a primary key, a field, and a value. And then there's this, higher level function merge object that takes an, uh, basically a Python dictionary representing a, a, an object and tries using merge semantics, tries to write all the fields and values into that object by calling set value. So set value is defined using the at, at transactional decorator. Merge value, the higher level function, is also defined using the same transactional decorator. 
and basically they become one transaction. The composition works. So in effect, when you do a merge option, all of the writes are going to be performed or it'll fail and none of them will be performed. The bottom line is that comp composing these transactional functions just works the way you would expect it to. So keyspace. Keyspace in FoundationDB is basically the set of possible byte strings. So they're ordered from the empty string to um, 255, the strings beginning with 255. And you may, you may think, oh, that's kind of yucky. I have to work with byte strings, you know, writing byte strings to the database. That's all I can write. Well, it, it turns out, no. It, it, within the uh, Python binding, you can represent these keys as tuples. And there's, they're also structured um, using something called subspaces that make them very nice to work with. So what ends up happening is you can basically use ordinary Python data types and the conversion to byte strings happen. The binding takes care of that and does the conversion. So the tuple layer within the binding allows you to use compound keys formed from Python tuples. And it automatically translates between tuples and byte strings while preserving their order. So it's an intelligent translation that maintains lexical order. So whatever the lexical order of the byte strings would be is the same as the lexical order of the, um, the tuples if you were to simply compare them in Python. So here's a simple example. We're doing a little graph model here where we're going to represent um, edges and nodes. And we, we represent the tuple edge n1, n2 is our tuple. The tuple operation packs that into a byte string, and then it, then it gets used as a key. And this preservation of order is really, really, really important because it allows us to do these efficient range reads that turn out to just be inc incredibly powerful. There's also a notion of subspaces, which provide namespaces for category of data. So if you think about lexicographical ordering of strings, if you take a st uh, the prefix of any string like, say, apple, and then you think of all the strings that can be formed by extending apple, like applesauce, say, it turns out all of the substrings that you can form, all the strings you can form by extending a given prefix are sort of like a subspace nested under apple in this case. So it gives you a very uh, simple, convenient namespacing capability. And this has been sort of um, packaged up using a class called subspace that autom when you take an instance of a subspace, it, it, it um, has within it, it stores within it the prefix that you're going to work with. So here, for example, on top, I have this edge object that's an instance of subspace. And inside of it, it knows, oh, I'm using the edge prefix. So you can use this syntax on top, um, edge of n1, n2 with subscripts, rather than the tuple syntax below. And it gives you a, a very convenient way to, to work with them. Um, with uh, keys. There's also a notion of directories I won't talk too much about. Um, it it's basically gives you a tool for using named paths, like the hierarchical paths in a Unix-like file system. And these get subspaces automatically allocated to them. And what, in effect, it allows you to do is something like the MV operation when you're in a shell in a Unix-like operating system. You can move around large blocks of data or it looks like you're moving around a large block of data. You're not really moving the data at all. What you're actually doing is renaming the label that points to that data, So, which is exactly what an MV does as well. Um, so it gives you a, a very nice management tool. So uh, blocks of data can be easily and quickly moved about. OK, so data modeling. The way this actually works when you're using the, the Python binding for FoundationDB is you represent your data the same way you ordinarily would in Python using your ordinary data types, ints, strings, tuples, lists, dictionaries, classes, whatever you want to use. And you can, of course, build larger structures you know, with a little programming of vectors, graphs, queues, whatever you want, and then map those to the key value store, taking advantage of that ordering property. And on our website, we have a section of design recipes showing how to do graphs and queues and other structures like that stored in the database. Um, and it turns out that most of these things are like half a page of Python code. It's very simple to define these mappings. OK, an example I'll, I'll go into a little bit with an object store. This is um, a very, very, very simplistic sort of object store I have the code for on the GitHub. The data is held in Python dictionaries. It's, it's schemaless. 
in the sense that the fields are not fixed. You can add or, or delete uh, fields at will. It allows for single values, for multi-valued or set-valued fields, for large values with blobs, and there's some optional indexing built in. But it's meant to be a very simple sort of example, and the code defines an API for basic CRUD operations with the database. So how would you do this? How would you take an object like uh, it could be, uh, you could think of a JSON object, or you could think of data stored in a Python dictionary. They're, they're sort of isomorphic. Um, and think, how would you store that in a, in a key value database? Well, the first thing that might pop into your mind is just to serialize it. You could serialize it using th something like pickle or JSON dumps. Um, very simple. And then just that becomes your value. You have some unique identifier as your key. And then the serialized thing just becomes your value. You write the key value pair, you're done. Well, that's very, very simple, but it's a little bit of an anti-pattern. It turns out that's not a great idea, especially if your objects are larger, because it means you, can know, you cannot read individual fields, read or write individual fields. You have to read back the entire object each time. And if you want to like modify a field, you modify it in memory, then you write back the whole object. That's not great. It also doesn't give you any way to like index individual fields or anything like that. So we want to think a little bit more. Turns out a better mapping is to split up that object. So we're going to split the object and even, we may even split up individual fields among multiple keys. And then we read and write individual fields. And we're also going to throw in some indexing there to um, get efficient access. And this helps us to keep keys and values small, which is um, best for efficiency. So splitting data is the pattern. OK, so here's an example on top, um, some JSON uh, data. You can eat, it's very simple how you would store that in a Python dictionary. And then it's going to get mapped to something like this below. You'll notice that for these the second and third row on the bottom, you have multi-value fields with more than one key value pair. Um, the two, this is, represents an email message. The two field had two addressees. Um, so each of those becomes its own key value pair. And you'll notice that there's some index things here on the bottom. So I'm actually indexing some fields. And I'll explain on the next slide you know, what that mapping looks like. And there's the explanation. OK, so, so for, for single-valued fields, it's very simple. We just have this tuple store represents our object store. Single is representing the field type single-value field. Then we have a primary key, a field name. That composite forms our entire key. We set that to the value. For multi-valued fields, it's the same. We've changed the tag to multi, so we know we're dealing with a multi-valued field. But what we've done is we've pulled the value into the key. Because keys are unique, if we didn't do that, you'd only be able to have one. But the whole point of a multi-valued field is you want more than one. So by pulling that value into the key, you can now have as many as you want because you've uniqueified it with the value. And that's actually fairly um, common in FoundationDB that values get pulled into the keys when it helps you, when it's appropriate. And then the index turns out to be exactly the same, except the field comes to the left. We've, we've inverted the order of those values in the tuple because it's the order that's going to establish that lexicographical order on the tuples that the database is maintaining and let us do our efficient range reads. OK, so using Python to query the object store, what does that sort of look like? Well, in our SQL layer, we have full ANSI SQL. In our document layer, we have like a Mongo-like query language. But here in the Python binding, we simply have Python. So how would you actually get the data out of a database in a, in a flexible way simply using Python? Well, it turns out Python has great constructs for that. Um, using generators, using iter tools, using comp comprehensions. Um, you can munge data streams really, really well and do very flexible sorts of querying without any sort of separate query language. So generators, let's, let's look at that just as a, as a beginning. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Python generators, but if you're not, you should uh, learn more about them because they're really cool. Um, generators can be used to um, be very uh, more efficient in memory. They avoid building lists in memories um, so that if you don't actually need all the data at once, if you're simply processing a data stream element by element, there's a win there. They support very efficient filtering of data streams and early termination if you're like reading a stream item by item. And they also um, 
So all, all of the read methods that are defined in the API will return generators when, they're, um, pro when, they're, when the answer is a stream of data. So generators really support producing efficient data streams. So there's this get by value is one of the API methods in the um, CRUD API. And what it simply does is, um, given a field and a value, it returns a generator of primary keys that match that field and value. So primary keys for objects that have that particular field and value. And if the field is indexed, get by value will take advantage of that index and let you do that um, retrieval with a single range read on the index. If it's not indexed, it's much more expensive. You end up having to scan, basically doing a scan over all the objects. So that's where indexing um, is really powerful and it's supported by this ordering. Okay, as an example, I'm using the Enron um, corpus of emails. I've, I found out this weekend, apparently the canonical example to use for this sort of thing is the New York taxicab data. I'm gonna have to update this. I mean, I, I, I just didn't know, but heck, I'll, I'll, I'll get, up, get up to speed on that. Um, so Enron is a publicly available uh, data set of real emails, 60,000 emails from the Enron Corporation when the um, Enron Corporation was like, I don't know, had tr criminal charges for its fraud. Um, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission basically seized all its emails as evidence and eventually turned it over into the public domain. So that's where this comes from. And it's been used fairly extensively for NLP research, social network research, that sort of thing. And emails are like very, because they're sort of JSON-like in their shape, they're very easy to map to this object store. So for the mapping is simply going to be each person um, is going to become an object, um, and I'm going to use the email address as the primary key. Of course, that's not entirely accurate because a person could have more than one email, but it's close enough. Um, and then each message will also become an object represented by the message ID. And then the sender of a message, who sent the message, will be stored with the person in this field, MI sender, and all the other data associated with the email Five minutes or? Uh, All right, already over? Not a problem. Okay, so um, if you want to uh, talk to me more or ask questions, I'll be happy to um, do that anytime. Thank you very much.